Hey guys, here we are again. It's Wednesday, April 1st. Uh, we've got no April Fool's jokes for you. Um, I think we wasted about 10 minutes before we got started last time. So we're going to just get started a little bit quicker uh, for tonight. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we were able to Zoom with, uh, I don't know, 20 or 25 of you last Sunday night. Uh, we just tried sending a few texts out to those that we know are there every Sunday and uh, asking you guys to start sharing that number out. Uh, this Sunday, we plan on getting back together. Um, Chloe's going to lead a girls group, and Toby's going to lead a guys group. And if there's way too many in those groups, we'll figure out how to divide those up. But we just want to have some time of uh, reading and praying together on Sunday night. So download the Zoom app. Uh, figure out how you can how you can do that on your phone or on your computer or uh, even if you don't have a way to do it that way, we can give you a phone number where you can call in and listen. So we want you to be ready for that. And then we'll uh, contact everybody on Sunday and, and see if we can get together around six o'clock, maybe six fifteen on Sunday. Uh, it won't be as much a cutting up and playing like it was last week. It'll be more of uh, us talking through and reading and praying together. So looking forward to seeing you guys on that uh, zoom platform, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, James chapter five verses one through six is going to be what we focus on. Um, so Toby is pulling this up on the screen right now. Uh, do y'all see that? I don't see it yet. Oh, there it is. All right. So, uh, that is the screen being shared. Okay. So now it's up. So James chapter five, uh, one through six is what we're going to mo mostly focus on. You see a little bit more there on the page. Uh, Toby's going to read that for us and Chloe's going to pray and we're just going to mow on through Bible study. So come yeah, so we're going to start in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your, your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. All right, guys, let's pray. Um, Lord, we just come to you now um, as we dive into this passage of your word. Lord, just give us understanding. Um, Lord, help us to know how we should um, take this and live it out or give us the Holy Spirit to walk out um, living in generosity. Um, Lord, you are so good and we can trust that um, you will provide for our every need, that you are sufficient. Um, so Lord, help us to, to trust you with our lives from day to day, um, even in the midst of uncertainty so that we might um, live in a way that represents Christ well to those um, that we are around. Um, Lord, we love you, and I just pray that this time will be honoring to you and glorifying to you, even if it's in a new format that some of us might not be used to, um, or just let this time be encouraging to our hearts, but mostly uh, glorifying to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so we are uh, picking up here in James chapter 5. Uh, if you guys have your Bible, it'd be great to open it up to it. The scriptures are on the screen there for us. But it would be great to continue to uh, read through your Bible and work through your Bibles like we have for the last couple months in James. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about a context first, the context of this passage. Um, look here in, uh, in verse 1 and verse 3, verse 5, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9. Um, what we're seeing here, uh, yep, and I lost my page that has that, but this Look at these verses with me. Um, verse one says that uh, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. This is in the context of the Lord's judgment. Okay, this warning to the rich uh, is in the context of the Lord's judgment. Look here in verse three, and you'll see this context some more. It says that uh, corrosion uh, will be evidence against you, will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure in the last days. It's judgment for that. Look in verse five. Uh, you lived on this earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fattened your hearts 
in a day of slaughter. You see the day of slaughter, that judgment is coming. Verse 7, we didn't read 7, 8, and 9, um, but you see he says uh, the coming of the Lord in verse 7, reference to the judgment. Uh, verse 8, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Again, the judgment of the Lord is coming. Verse 9, uh uh, don't grumble, grumble one against one another, brother, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So judgment is coming. God the judge is coming. And so in the context of this judgment in this whole passage, uh, James is offering a warning to the rich. And his warning is watch out, um, watch out. And uh, so most people believe, and I say most people, I believe this, and most people I know I believe that this is a passage that's written about rich non-Christians. So the wealthy people who are not believers, this is written about. If you look at these words, as Chloe mentioned to Toby and I, and you, you look at the words and the description here of how these people are acting, this is not uh, characteristic of people who are redeemed. This is not characteristic of people who've been set free from their sin and the bondage of their sin and the and uh, this isn't characteristic of people who love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them, who love their neighbors as themselves, those who, who give sacrificially because Christ gave his life for them that they know um, and they're, um, they desire to give their lives for others. These, these words that we were just reading, verses 1 through 6, it's not characteristic of Christians. Um, it's a warning to rich uh, non-believers about their lives and the futility of their lives and the destruction of their lives and what, what happens when they set themselves up uh, for this and they live their lives towards this wealthy, in excess financial goal and where they take advantage of people and they hoard and they live in excess and it leads to the death of those around them and murdering and hate and those kind of things. Um, so then the question has to be, if, if this wasn't written to Christians, if it was written to wealthy unbelievers, wealthy non-Christians, then why is this in the Bible? Why is James writing this to Christians? If he's writing about non-Christians, why, why is it to us? Well, for two things. Number one, for believers to know that God is uh, not silent, that God is not going to let this go. Scripture tells us that, that all sins... Uh, will go punished, that God will not allow any sin to go unpunished. Um, and those that are living in a way that they're taking advantage of others and they're hurting others and they're living in excess while people around them are starving, those that are living with, with excess and extra when people are going without, um, that God won't allow that to go unpunished, that he'll deal with that. And so the first is for us to know that uh, God's still the judge and he's not going to let any sin go unpunished. But the second reason is because um, that James is being clear that uh, as Christians, we need to make sure that we look very different than what we're seeing here. That, um, that Christians who are wealthy should not be living this kind of life. And so if these characteristics are a part of us, if we're finding our hope in that or we're living our lives towards amassing wealth and comfort and excess, then we need to see this as a warning for not letting this be us. And so right now, a lot of us are thinking, man, okay, we are not wealthy. Like most people that are listening to this video are saying, well, this is not me. I'm not really wealthy. I, I've heard of wealthy people, but I'm not wealthy. Understand this. The facts are that every single person that's watching the screen right now is wealthy. Um, that like, I mean, I, a couple of years ago, I read some numbers that said, if you make $25,000 a year, but if your household has $25,000 a year, then you live in the top 2% or 1%, um, in the world. Uh, everybody that's listening to this had something to eat today. And everybody who's listening to this or watching this means they're holding a phone or a device, uh, that is probably worth more than most third world countries, um, families have in a year. And so like, this is a, it's a dangerous thing for us to think, well, this is not about me that I'm not, I'm not wealthy. Well, no, that's not true. It, this is us. This is about us. Whether we know people that are wealthier than we are not doesn't change the fact that we have, and that most of the time we have in excess. So what are we going to do with what God has, has given us? Well, how are we going to treat, um, 
others and how are we going to treat what God has given us? So there's some warnings here that we're going to kind of walk through. And then we're all just going to kind of apply this at the end. Toby and Chloe are going to give their thoughts and ask some questions. And I'll ask some questions kind of at the end. So let's just uh, continue to, to go through this. So first warning, uh, first reason it's there. Um, this is here that we're reading is because uh, God's not going to let sin go unpunished. So uh, we can know that those that are getting away with hoarding and excess, that God's going to take care of that, and he'll punish that sin. The judge is standing at the door. Uh, verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, that we looked at a minute ago. And then the second is that we need to make sure that this is not us and that we need to run from this sin and run towards Christ and run towards his righteousness that he gives um, okay, so uh, let's talk about the text a little bit more then. Um, verse four, there's, a couple, there's four things that I kind of want to point out, and they're all kind of connected, but there's four things that, that point out for like, what is God going to judge? What is God going to judge for? Um, and the first one is that God's going to judge for hoarding. Um, you, you see how it says that, uh, that they've laid up treasure uh, in the last days says that uh, you, you've you laid up treasure um, in the last days. So there's been this, some hoarding. And when we think of hoarding right now, we're thinking of examples of like people grabbing toilet paper off the shelves in the grocery stores and stuff like that. Um, that that's Maybe that's a little bit of an application and understanding what's happening here. But here's what's really happening here is that there are those who are wealthy and have a lot. And so you have to ask question, well, how did they become wealthy? Well, look in verse four, the second part, God's going to judge for hoarding and for, for having more than we need and holding on to that, thinking that that, th that stuff's going to make us happy, or that stuff's going to satisfy us. And we're not sharing it with others because we think we need it. All right. And then a uh, second one there uh, for failing to pay wages. Look in verse four, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts it says that they basically stolen from their workers people that are that are uh, looks like it's saying cutting the grass mowed their fields but it really means of the harvesters those who've done the work of the harvest those who've gone out into the fields and collected the grain and harvested the fruit and did all of that hard work brought that back laid it at the at the, into the place of the, uh, the the land owners and said here here's the work that I've done here's what, what I've done here. And then, uh, they haven't gotten paid. Okay. They've gotten, they haven't gotten paid every time they haven't gotten paid fairly. They don't have enough to live on. And so they have been, uh, defrauded. It's not just failed to pay wages, but they failed to, uh, to pay wages means that they've stolen. Like I'm supposed to give you money for cutting my grass, I'm supposed to give you for money for harvesting my field. And I don't give you the money. So basically I'm keeping that I'm stealing it from those that have done the work for me and have helped my business and helped, um, helped me to earn a living. Uh, I've earned a living on their backs and I've, I've stolen from them. Uh, the next one you see in verse five, you've lived in the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Uh, they've lived in a way where they've, they've, used, they've had more than they've needed and they haven't shared it. Um, and now it says, and look what it says it's doing. It's fatting them up for fatting up their hearts in the day of slaughter. So this is not just an issue where where they're literally becoming becoming uh, physically fattened up for slaughter, but their hearts have become fattened up and their hearts are not caring anymore. They don't care that they've defrauded people. And sometimes we come up with like excuses to say, well, it's my field anyway. You know, it's my stuff. They wouldn't have a job if I didn't give them a job or whatever could be said of this way. And so it, it shows that it's not just that in their actions, but their hearts have been affected by this wealth. Their hearts have been affected by this luxury and self-indulgence. And so it's even affected their, uh, their hearts and condition there. And the last one, it says it leads to the murdering. All right, you've condemned and murdered the righteous person. Uh, most commentators that write about this passage, that write about this, say that here's what's happened here. When the day laborers, when the people who were expecting uh, to be paid for their work uh, leave the field with no money that day, leave the field with no fruit or grain that day, that that's enough for them to die. That's enough for their families 
to die. They don't have, it's not like, well, I didn't get paid this week, so I'm not going to get to go on vacation. It's more of, well, when you didn't get paid this week, you don't have enough to take care of your family and, uh, and death occurs. And so uh, it wasn't wealth that the rich were, uh, were, be, were in trouble for. They weren't in trouble for having wealth. They were in trouble for how they got their wealth. They were in trouble with what they did with their wealth. They were being condemned with their actions and their self-indulgence and their lack of care or compassion uh, for their neighbor, uh, for those that worked for them, those that worked around them. That's what they were in trouble for. Um, Luke chapter 12, I want to read. Um, it's a great example here. Uh, Luke 12, um, Jesus tells them a parable says this, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. This is 12, 16 through 21. It says the, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger, larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many, many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. What a, what a, perfect description of where our hearts can go if we just listen to the world. We're being discipled day by day by the world, whether we know it or not. The world's been teaching us and telling us things, and little by little, we believe it, and we believe, well, if I, if I do have a lot of stuff and have nothing to do with my stuff, let me just build a bigger barn to hold all my stuff. Let me get a bigger house. Let me get a bigger car. Let me have more in my 401k. Let me have more in all of these places so I can produce... Um, a, a life that is more beneficial for me and, and for what I want um, of the world. And so this is, this is the full, all right, uh, eat, drink, and be merry is what he says to himself. But then God steps in and says to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, uh, whose will they be? And then uh, Jesus says this, so this is the one who lays up treasure for himself and it's not rich towards God. And so pursuing anything other than Christ is not a safe bet. It is not safe for us to try to amass or pursue anything other than Christ, but to look to Christ and look to his kingdom and say, Lord, you've blessed me with knowledge. How will I use this for you? Lord, you've blessed me with a job, how will I use this for you? Lord, you've blessed me with this education or this opportunity for education. How will I use this for you? How could I serve you and follow you for this? What can I, what can I share with my life? What can I share with my time so that others know the goodness and glory of Jesus? Yeah. And so uh, at this point, I kind of want to focus on, on, on one more part of the verse, and then I'll ask uh, Toby and Chloe, uh, just to lead us through some discussion, but verse four, um, I want to uh, share with you. And this is, uh, this is just to hear when we are concerned. Um, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back with fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters, listen to this, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. Okay, so I'm sorry, I wanted to stop here. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Let me say this. Um, those that are being defrauded, those who are being mistreated, those who are being stolen from and are living without their basic necessities, their cries have heard the Lord of hosts. The Lord will judge those who are defrauding them those who are stealing from them. And the Lord has heard the cries of people who are without. Um, so we need to have the heart of the Lord and know the Lord has heard that and we need to serve others and we need to give and share in ways that honor the Lord. But just understand this, if you're in a place now where you're struggling and you are, you are in need, um, understand the Lord has heard your prayers. Um, the Lord has heard your cries and he has not forgotten um, about you. So, um, well, to uh, look at it, I'm getting some messages from Pastor Bart right now. I think I kind of need to answer him. So I'm gonna let Chloe and Toby uh, kind of take over this discussion and uh, 
and kind of discuss this. Like, what does this, what does this look like uh, for us or what, what do we need to discuss regarding this passage? Yeah, I know one thing that Toby and I were talking about earlier today is just the fact that uh, it's really easy as um, a junior high or high school student or even a college student to say, oh, this is just another passage about money. I don't really need to pay attention all that much because I don't really have money. Any money that I have is my parents or um, I don't have any to begin with. And so we just kind of read over this and say, well, I'm good. I can check that box off. Um, but that's really dangerous because um, like we talk about every week, ultimately there's um, more to it than just what's on the surface that ultimately it's about where our heart is and whether or not our heart has been transformed and has um, been changed by the Holy Spirit. And so I look at this and um, think how much better I would be at being generous if I would have started practicing smaller things whenever I was 13 um, instead of just ignoring these passages and saying oh, I don't have money if I would have said you know I can be generous with my time I can be generous with the things that I do have I can practice not um, storing things up for myself just out of fear that I won't have it later um, if I would have been practicing that earlier in life then I wouldn't have to learn that now um, and so one thing, one passage that um, helps me now to live in generosity um, is Philippians 4. Um, and I'll just read some of that for you, and then I'll let Toby kind of explain some more stuff for us. Um, so I'm going to read Philippians 4, and I'm going to start um, in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonable be reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, with which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Um, and so this isn't a passage directly about how you should spend your money, right? But it is a passage that tells us um, what we should be setting our minds on and what we should be clinging to when we are tempted to be anxious about tomorrow. And so instead of saying, well, in a week, I might need this money so I'm just going to hold on to it, even though I see a need in someone else's life. I can say with confidence that the Lord's going to provide what I need, um, even if it's not the way I thought it should be provided, right? The Lord knows best, but I can take um, a lot of confidence in knowing that whenever I make my requests known to God, that he hears those, um, and that whenever I think and dwell on what is worthy of praise, then my attention is being given to the Lord and not to my stuff. Yeah. Um, and so that's just been a really helpful way for me to take passages like these and really kind of walk them out in day-to-day -day life. Well, let, let, me, let me jump us over to Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 24. Um, the, the end of this, this is the, this is the passage that most people believe that James had on his mind from the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that the book of James, a parallel Sermon on the Mount. He's, James is thinking of what his brother Jesus said, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, this passage here, I mean, word for word, it's copying what we see in, in the first few verses of James chapter five. Uh, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And look in verse 24, and this is what, what you were saying there. It's no one can serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so when you're focused on serving God, 
it takes your focus away from wealth and possessions and money and those things. But when your mind is focused, when your eyes are full of darkness and they're looking at wealth and possessions and materials and earthly comforts and in those things, it takes our minds away from serving the Lord and uh, storing up those right things. Yeah. And as I think about giving you know, I can't help but think of the gospel. And if you look in Philippians 2, Paul writes about Jesus, and he says that Jesus was equal with God and laid down that equality with God to come and to serve us and to give his life for us so that we could have eternal life, so that we could receive salvation. And so I think that as we look at this idea of giving and the money that we do have, I think that a couple things happen when we begin to participate in this. And the first thing I would say is that if Jesus is the image of God, that he is the human representation of who God is, then we see that Jesus gave. And so the first thing is that it is this action of giving is making us more like Jesus. And the second thing is that it is causing us to have to lean on and trust in God to provide for our needs. Like we say that we believe that God provides for us, that God will meet our needs. But when, when it actually comes to it, when we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, do we actually believe that God will meet our needs if we are um, sacrificing, uh, giving up our wealth and our resources for the Lord and in Matthew, uh, I believe chapter six, Jesus talks about this and he says that, you know, if the flowers of the field are clothed in their beauty mm -hmm. and that if the sparrow does not worry about whether or not it will eat because the Lord provides it, how much more will he provide for us what we need as his children, as those that he has created in his likeness? And so I believe that the same God that has given us eternal life is not going to leave us hanging in this life and not meet our needs if we are putting our faith in him and trusting in him and obeying him that if we are doing what he has called us to which is to give and to be generous with our wealth and our possessions and to serve others through that i believe that he will meet our needs and that mm -hmm. it's just a matter of do i have the faith and trust in the lord that he really will do what he has said he will do yeah that's good that's good. And when, when we have been given, uh, when we've been given what we need the most, when we know that everything we, we need and ha everything that we have to have and everything we need is, is given to us in Christ, then those other things we're not as, uh, we, we, we know we don't need. As Chloe shared with us, um, you know, you know the Lord's going to take care of you, and so you can give. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, this was demonstrated to us in, in the gospel that, that Christ gave us all, um, that he gave us all we needed. And so we don't have to be fearful of our life. We don't have to be fearful, um, of those things. And we don't have to be fearful of, of having what we need to live and what we need to serve him because he's promised, um, in Christ, uh, to give us what we need. Yeah. So about, uh, let me kind of jump back into our the beginning of our passage five, uh, just to talk about like the frailty of, of wealth, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth eaten, your silver and gold have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Three examples there, riches first that says have rotted. So these are riches that aren't like gold and silver because those don't rot, they corrode and they're talked about later. But the riches at the beginning would be like their grain their fruit, those things that they have that they think they have a lot of uh, and they've hoarded have rotted away. And so they're not just there, but they're a nuisance. They're causing smell. They're causing odor. They're causing uh, infection. They're causing nastiness that now have to be cleaned up and there has to be work against those. The garments um, are useless and not only are useless, but the excess garments that they had are now causing them trouble because the garments that the, the moths that are eating those, those clothes are reproducing in a way that they're eating the, the main clothes that they're wearing. So it's affecting everything. The gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion is evidenced against you. And so like the, 
what we need to remember about our wealth is not only is our wealth something that we should share, but it's dangerous for us to keep and hold on to um, in excess like this because it rots away and it's evidence against us. Uh, so we need to think about wealth in that way that uh, and see that warning that um, when we think wealth is going to satisfy us, when we see think wealth is going to be uh, something that's going to make us happy, we need to understand that the opposite uh, could be true and here was true is that the wealth actually created problems for them. If they had just enough, they would be fine. But because they have too much, it's causing major problems for them and causing major problems in their lives. Uh, I know kind of a fun example of that is, uh, you know, like I have, uh, have a bunch of vehicles now that have a lot of miles and that are really old and have a lot of scratches. And uh, I'm not fearful at all of what may happen to my vehicle because it's old and I don't really care if you open your car door up on it. Uh, but at one time before I got married, um, I bought a new Honda Accord that I thought was just great and wonderful. And I was very fearful about where I parked it and where I put it and things. And so like, I don't know if that, that doesn't necessarily give a good example to all this, but like we're fearful of the stuff like that, that we think, man, this is, this is just perfect. A lot of times things that are imperfect are a lot easier to live with uh, than things that are perfect. And so um, I, that's just kind of a little bit of an example for uh, how, how our wealth can, uh, can be a problem for us and how our, our nice things and nice stuff can, uh, can actually create more problems and create more anxiety um, rather than make things better for us. You guys got anything else? Yeah, I think that when we put our hope and our stock in those things, we see that they always fade away, that they always pass away. They never, they never last. And, you know, you look at, especially I feel like with clothing, you're always wanting to be with the trends. You want to be getting what's considered, you know, in and popular at the time. And then all of a sudden what you've bought, you're already looking again and you're saying, well, what else can I get? What else? And ultimately it's, it's a question of, is your heart satisfied in the Lord or is it satisfied in stuff? And so as long as we chase after stuff, there's always going to be this emptiness that we're left with after we've been met with this grat gratification and this momentary joy, it always passes away. And what the Lord is offering is eternal joy. You know, yeah. He says, I am the fountain of living water, this water that doesn't fade away, that doesn't perish. If you drink of it, you'll never be thirsty again. Mm -hmm. And yet so often we think that the other things in our life are going to provide that satisfaction. And ultimately they corrode, they rot, and they're moth-eaten. But if you look in First Peter uh, chapter 1, he says that the inheritance that Jesus has for us laid up in heaven is imperishable undefiled and unfading that mm. is kept in heaven for us and is guarded uh, those who are being guarded by god it is kept for us an inheritance that doesn't corrode that doesn't rot and that, that isn't moth eaten doesn't perish and so we have an eternal hope of eternal life with the father that will not fade away that is for sure it's an anchor that we can cling to and hold on to and yet so often we turn to other things and then wonder why we're being tossed and thrown left and right because we've weighed our hope in something that just won't last it's not standing yeah yeah and it's i'm just reminded of um that d now theme that we had that kind of is a slogan for us now that we say like jesus plus nothing is everything. And so when we say that the Lord will meet your needs, we're not saying that whenever you work really hard to be a good person, or you even work really hard to be a good Christian, that you'll automatically just have everything your heart could ever want. That you'll have the nicest house, the nicest car, the nicest friends, the nicest whatever. Like that's not the promise. The promise is that we get Jesus, and that's everything. He's everything, yeah. And so that is that's why we have such a hope. And so I don't want anyone to be misled um, to say 
that when we say like you will get everything that you need from the Lord. Um, that's why we don't have to be anxious. That doesn't mean that you'll just, you know, randomly find a $100 bill because that's how this works. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that Jesus is everything and that's why we have hope for the future and for now. Um, that it's not, we don't have to put our hope in riches or in anything of this earth because ultimately like Toby said, it will fade away. Yeah. Yeah. So as we think about what you just said there, Chloe, the Lord does promise to meet our needs, but I think a lot of times what will happen is that we start to think that our wants are our needs and we don't make a differentiation there that we have selfish wants and desires that we could desire that we put, you know, money into the stock market and we succeed that we get the newest clothes that we get the newest car, but those aren't necessarily holy desires. And so when in Matthew, Jesus says, you know, seek first the kingdom of God, and then, you know, he will give you everything that you need delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What happens is that when you put God first in your life, what you begin to desire is actually his glory and the gospel to be spread among the nations. And so that becomes your first and primary desire. And God gives you that desire. He gives you the desire of your heart when your desire is for the Lord, yeah. but not when it's just selfish desire and selfish wants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so the warning to the rich, the warning to the rich unbeliever, this is uh, a warning for us all to receive, um, even as Christians. Um, but what I want to be clear to say, uh, tonight is that the rich unbeliever who has been taking advantage of people his whole life, who has been uh, hurting and condemning others by not sharing and giving to others, um, has a spiritual need that every person on this earth needs. The, those that are wealthy, those that are poor, uh, those who are in Christ, and those who are apart from Christ. We all need forgiveness that is only given through Jesus Christ. What we need is to have a new heart. And the only way we get a new heart is if God gives us a new heart. Um, the gospel tells us that Jesus has died to take away the sins of all who confess and believe and trust in him, who repent from their sins and who turn to Jesus for forgiveness. And so what the rich person needs uh, and what I need and what you need are all the same is that we need Jesus to take away our sins and we need God to give us the righteousness of Jesus. And so I want to lead us through prayer now and kind of in closing. And, uh, and part of this will be to recognize and affirm what we just said there. And then uh, part of our prayer time would be uh, for us to confess that we need God to help us from, uh, um, from chasing after wealth, from being selfish, from uh, from living in a living our lives in a way that puts us first. So let's pray. Father, we love you, and we give you thanks, and we give you praise uh, for your goodness. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Father, we pray that we would turn away um, from our sins and we would turn towards you. Father, we need the righteousness of Christ. Father, because we have all been guilty of selfishness. We've all been guilty um, of hating our brother, which is murder. We've all been guilty of sinning against you, a perfect and holy God. Father, we need forgiveness. Um, that forgiveness can only come through um, Jesus. It only comes through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so, Father, we call on you now, and we ask um, that you would forgive us. Father, for those who stand before you righteous because of Jesus. Father, may we continually confess our uh, sins before you. And may we uh, continually repent of our sins and turn to you and ask for help. And for Father, those who are listening now who have never placed their trust in you, Father, I pray that you would give them faith to believe and faith to repent and faith to trust in you. Father, help us to see um, that wealth is not what we need. Help us to see that wealth is futile and will never make us happy. But, Father, help us to see um, that the things of this world also will never make us happy. But, Father, help us to see that serving you, um, following after you, and chasing after you um, 
is what we need. So, Father, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, great to see you guys. Uh, feel free to share this message and to uh, make some comments on YouTube or Facebook and uh, send, us a, send us a message. Uh, my number is 318-664-3081. So uh, I'd love to hear from you this week and uh, I'd love to know what's going on with you guys. And like we said earlier, we'd love to see you on uh, Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Okay? Love you guys. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye-bye.